number one seed because I'm the one looking for the norm actually. Um, but well, it, it happens. It makes it harder, right? Because <laughs> you have to like win almost all your games, don't you? Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, to get the norm, I have to uh, make seven out of nine. Ooh, very high score yeah. for that tournament. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty pretty daunting. So task, you you but... have you have to kind of play for the wins then, right? Not draw. Yeah. yeah. And, and my expected score is uh, six, I believe. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's going to be. And, and you need to hit hard. you need to hit a certain performance rating like 20 25 25 50 or something it's uh no it's 24 51. okay oh you can uh, do that uh, <laughs> it, the problem is that it's seven out of nine and um, yeah I, I know most of the players there and they are all very tough to beat so uh it's a pretty high mm. score and I hope I... and it's a nine round swiss right yeah, mm. uh, it's a right now. It's a round robin. It's um, yeah. Oh, it's a round it robin. Is, it's a round robin. Oh, okay. Uh, but there are there no, oh so there's nine players or eight eight other players. Uh, we are ten players. It's a nine round. Oh, oh sorry, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and do you have any IM norms yet? No. Um, Actually, I only played in two tournaments that uh, awarded oh. uh, the norms. Um, one was a round robin. It was the national championship. Uh, and I, I missed the norm by half a point. Oh. <laughs> and the other one was uh, when I was 14, I wasn't prepared to, uh, to get the norm. And it was the uh, continental championship. Uh, it was a very big tournament. And, well, I, I didn't even come close to it. Uh, so this is the third time around I have the chance to to get a norm. I hope the third time's the charm. <laughs> and do you know, will that that link you sent me will that update live? Like like um, between uh, the rounds, do you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The chess result link. Uh, they will be uh, uploading the results and most probably the games too, uh, because we are. Uh, just a couple of players. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because uh, um, I mentioned it on my stream. So we're rooting for you, and we're gonna we're gonna keep up. Yeah. We're gonna keep up to date <laughs> and see how you do. Uh, that's great. Yeah. It's a little pressure. Yeah. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm all good. I'm all set up here, and I'll leave things for you to get started. Okay. So let's go to your uh, to game study. Okay. So let's see. That is. Yeah. I have. Um, that's the one with my games? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Okay. Well, it's been a while, and I saw that you played a lot of games. Uh, your ratings went up. And then down. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I tilted, I tilted a, a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I actually got down to 1,800. Um, so I went, I went really up, and then I went really down. And now I'm kind of in that phase where I'm a little... I'm a little confused. I'm not, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're feeling really good and sometimes you're just left a little bit scatterbrained. That's where I am right now. <laughs> well, it's perfectly normal. I mean, um, ratings are a range. Um, you're somewhere in between the, uh, the 900s and the 2000s some. So that's fine. That's your range. Um, and well, uh, across across all the, um, the time controls, I saw that you... Uh, that you lifted your performances, that's good. And you're on your your way up on rapid again. So, um, so hang in there. I saw that uh, at some point you were blundering uh, quite a lot when you tilted, as you said. Uh, I know the feeling. It's very difficult uh, to stop playing <laughs> at that point, uh, and you just want to keep uh, to keep going at it and and your head is in a completely different place at that point. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty normal. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I, 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 uh, at the same token, like I, I, I definitely tilted. And I think partly why I tilted is because I know that if I really try hard, I'm capable of beating even like 2,100 rated players. Um, so when I lose to someone 1,900, 
um, I, I feel, I feel like I'm underperforming and, uh, I kind of, I get a bit frustrated because I feel like I should be, I should be able to win those games. Yeah, it happens. Uh, but well, uh, the good thing about the internet is that you can play as many games as you want and in a very short, uh, time mm -hmm. span. Uh, it's it's very different uh, in over the world because well you play a tournament you don't do well and suddenly you want to play a game but you can do it immediately mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's more frustrating here you, you can always uh, uh, you can always come back and play that's tomorrow true. and that's <laughs> yeah uh, it's important to bear that in mind uh, I also tend to get frustrated when I I, I just not working for me and well i try to stop playing at that point and try <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> yeah. uh, it's difficult but well what you're gonna do uh but you're on your way up even on rapid again so that's fine um i chose a couple of games of yours uh you have a lot of material of course because well uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, during these weeks uh we haven't uh, had a lesson but well let's go with this one against Scorpio 44. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, ah, okay. He was a Sicilian, of course, you were black. <laughs> uh, Knight of Seed. And here he played Bishop D3. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to talk about flexibility in the thinking about the opening. Uh, here you went for eight seats. Uh, you played your your beloved Nidorf. <laughs> uh, at this point, it's not defined. I mean, you can play a lot of things. And that bishop d3 at this point is is actually kind of a committal move. Uh, it's a perfectly playable move, but knight c3 is the overwhelming um, favorite alternative. When he played bishop d3, you continued playing as a normal knight of you always play a6 and d5, or at least most of the time, as I could see. Um, but if we go back a couple of moves, um, sometimes uh, we want to get our favorite setup uh, in any kind and shape. <laughs> uh, the thing is, uh, sometimes we have to take a look at what our opponent is doing and try to adapt. Uh, in the Nidorf, um, he kind of got to, I'm sorry, are you, uh, can I'm you hear me well? Yeah, I, I can uh, hear okay, you. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just that I have a little bit of feedback. Uh, now by delaying knight c3, he got to play c4 how did you feel about this um first of all i i just lowered my head volume headset volume um is is the feedback a little bit better now if you say yeah, something yeah yeah it's a little better it, it was just it was just um a couple of things i said oh, but now okay. It's okay yeah um c4 i don't remember this game um but <laughs> this was a rapid game it looks like it okay so yeah, how do I feel yeah. about C4? So it's kind of, it's almost like a, almost like a delayed Meroxy bind. It looks like, um, so I don't know. I, I felt, you know, often times white may place a move like a four to help prevent B five and C4 has the same, um, the same reaction, like uh, I can't really play b5 here anymore. Um, I think that he worsens his light squared bishop and he and he puts a, a lot of strengths on the d5 square, which is usually what we're fighting for in the in the Nidorf. Um, so I thought there were kind of pros and cons to it. My since he's kind of cementing in d5, my dark squared bishop is going to be uh, in a bit of pain for a while. Yeah, I don't know if this is what you have in mind when you play the Knight of. Uh, it's not bad at all. Uh, you are uh, you played a lot of reasonable moves and you're okay here. Uh, that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, but let's go back to Knight of Seeds here in the opening. Knight C3 is the overwhelming favorite. <laughs> uh, 
But then Bishop D3, uh, sometimes we have to take into account that the, that the opening is, is a phase where we also have to think. And what, what do I mean by, uh, by thinking the opening? Uh, we all tend to take the stance that the opening is, uh, well, in the opening we have our system, uh, we just throw in our usual moves and then uh, we get a certain scheme uh, we put the pieces in uh, some usual squares that we are accustomed to, and then we go into the middle game and let's see what happens. And that's partly true, but then again, there are instances where we have to be flexible. Uh, this bishop d3 is not a bad move at all, it's just too natural to be bad, but you haven't defined your opening yet. Uh, I mean, you can play virtually any Sicilian at this point, uh, or at least any Sicilian that goes with these seats, and that's pretty much all of them. <laughs> and you could go uh, like a Scheveningen, uh, you can play knight c seats, you can play e seats with knight bd7 in the style of Nidorf or knight c seats. Uh, you can play like you play like knight of like uh, with a seats. Uh, but actually, you can try to uh, look for a move that takes advantage of the fact that white defined this bishop just too early. Which system do you think you could employ here that kind of underlines that this move is a little bit premature? Um, well, sometimes against bishop d3, I think, because I, I can't remember if I always play the same move in response to it. Um, and I do have something in my repertoire, which I I forget. But um, the other move other than a6 that I was considering here was e5. Um, I think his bishop is not really going to get on uh, this diagonal because we're kind of cementing down the e4 pawn. So the e4 pawn can't advance. And uh, so e5 would be the other idea I have in here, but otherwise I'm not sure how we could really punish bishop d3. I don't really see it as a huge weakness. Well, e5 might be an improvement because uh, you didn't spend time on a6, uh, which is rather pointless because well, he's not going to go knight b5, a6 here, or you don't even need to kick the knight off b5 because he's certainly nothing. And if he goes back, then you can play, uh, well, just like you played in the game, and maybe save this tempo of a6, and maybe go a5 right away. We're going to see that this move at some point is uh, it's kind of thematic against knight b3. And that's one possibility. The other one is um, to try to take advantage of the fact that this knight is not defended, and this is very common across uh, many Sicilians. Knight c6. It's very natural here. I know it's not um, in the scheme of the knight of, um, because you want to play knight bd7 most of the time, uh, but now white has a choice to make. And if he goes back, then you're getting a perfectly playable position and it's not dangerous at all. <laughs> um, and if he changes on c seat, then you have a very nice pawn center and this should be no problem to you. Um, so knight c6 is a good way of putting the red pressure on the knight on d4. And the other one, uh, which I really like, is g6. How do you feel about the, I hate the, it. the dragon? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I just don't like Fianchettos. I know it's a stupid <laughs> stupid thing to say, but uh, I'm, I'm just... None of the openings I play and structures um, have any fianchettos, so I'm very uncomfortable with it. I'm not saying it's a bad move. I'm just uncomfortable because I'm not used to this type of thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> here, here it has a lot of advantages. Uh, in the dragon, this bishop is never on d3. I mean, white plays bishop c4 to itself pressure on f7. Uh, or else he leaves the bishop on f1 and tries to go uh, long, with long castling and throws everything at you on the king side. And by playing g6, you're kind of saying, well, your bishop is going to hit granite here. And none of your plans in the dragon work. And well, 
I kind of tricked you into into playing an inferior version of the dragon for white. <laughs> uh, so GCC, I guess, I guess it should give black a very good game because uh, white doesn't get to uh, to play the most active or the most uh, um, the main lines of the dragon, which are very dangerous for black. Uh, after bishop d3, it's not going to happen. Uh, so. Well, what do I want to get to? Um, against, especially suspicious looking, well, bishop d3 is not about blue, and it's strange to look in, to uh, call it suspicious looking. Uh, but you know, it's kind of out of character um, here so early in the game, especially if you haven't defined what you're going to play. So trying to take advantage of, um, of this move order things is a very important part of playing the opening well. Um, that's uh, that's only a, a little idea I wanted to, to express. Yeah, so to. maybe I'm not I'm not punishing white enough here with a six. <laughs> it's a it's a little bit too prophylactic, too too passive. It's um, it's a perfectly fine move and uh, you're not worse at all. Um, but I guess you could do better. E5, in the immediate E5, uh, well, I believe it's it's easier to achieve equality there. Uh, G6, I really like G6 because of what I said, that bishop on D3 doesn't belong on D3 in many of the variations of the name of the um, uh, dragon. Um, Knight C6 putting immediate pressure on D4 is a typical device against bishop D3 in well, across all Sicilians, um, but a seat, it's almost impossible to criticize. You can you can still uh, get to many theoretical variations in pretty much, um, well, in a lot of of lines of the Sicilian, not only on the Nidorf. He castled, and here you went for e5, which should be fine. E6 was also fine, but it's a different game. Um, and it kind of justifies this bishop here on d3. <laughs> and you play, uh, play with knight b3, bishop e 7 and well, here he got what he wanted. And it's a typical Maroxi, Maroxi bind with a lot of control over d5, um, but also uh, he has some misplaced pieces. This knight has to, to go somewhere. Uh, knight c3. Your castle up to this point, it's all very natural. And now you took knight takes d5. You took with a knight. Um, <laughs> you don't sound happy. Yeah, um, yeah I um, I remember this game now. I don't think it was that long ago. Maybe uh, a few days ago. Um, yeah. Okay. So my 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 reasoning here was I. Well, first of all, I. I felt I had to take because I, I didn't want him taking my bishop on. Uh, so I was basically wanting to keep the bishop pair. That was my idea. I was going to take the knight and then just um, bring that bishop back. There wasn't really much more thinking than that. <laughs> I just wanted the bishop pair. Okay. Um, well, on his part, knight if I might be a little bit premature. I would I would expect him to play bishop b3 and queen b2 first, and then at some point go knight d5 when he's better developed. But other than that, uh, you need a plan here. <laughs> and taking immediately is uh, maybe not bad, but you're defining the structure, and he's getting a nice uh, advantage in space while you still have to complete your development, and it turns out it's not so easy. Uh, a very common idea is to take with the bishop on d5, at least because this bishop is very difficult. It's very difficult to find something to do for him hmm. in the long run. And then you try to fit, uh, uh, to get some control of the dark squares. For example, if he goes uh, pound takes, 
A5 is kind of typical, and your idea is to go knight b b7, and at some point even knight c5. And uh, well, if he goes a4, he's kind of making a concession. This knight is suddenly on the air, b4 is weak. And your idea is to get some kind of blockade on dark squares, a uh, similar idea to, uh, to many names of Indians. <laughs> uh, but even Bishop takes these seats might be uh, d5. I'm sorry, it might be a little bit premature. I'm afraid that he can take with the e pawn, and now both bishops have their diagonal. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. Uh, that that looks really good for white. If you could go f5 and d4, well, that would be understandable. Just like the Pelicans, uh, Carlsen, uh, Carlsen is uh, accustomed to play uh, with a majority uh, for white on the queen side and a majority for black on the center and the king side. Uh, but, well, that's not the case. You're, you're not in time to play a 5 before and uh, white knight is going back to the king side. He can go a 4 and probably in your structure and he's going to be better. So bishop takes d5. I guess it's a little bit premature here, but you have to look into that one. Uh, I know it's strange to live with this knight, but you can get away with knight bd7, or even better, with knight c6. I think this move might be the best. You were afraid of him getting rid of your bishop here on e7. But I guess, I yeah, I guess uh, maybe I'm slightly overvaluing my bishops, especially that one, which I guess would be considered a pretty bad bishop. Yeah, sometimes this bishop on e7 is vital to defend this pawn on the seats, but uh, at this point, you're very well developed, and you're not going to have any kind of trouble defending here. Um, white white has, uh, has grabbed some space with c4, but he's also a little bit extended. So, for example, you can take with a knight, and then you're going to go rook c8 and hit immediately on c4. You can play queen c7, rook fd8, and you're perfectly mobilized here. Uh, he can't take advantage of the square on d5, and suddenly you're doing great. I was thinking about taking with a knight just because I was a little bit uncomfortable with uh, queen takes and bishop g5. Yeah, that's I, annoying to get out of, yeah. I guess you can go h6 followed by g5. Uh, I would rather not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it might be playable. It might be playable because I don't think he can get enough pieces to the king side to attack. But knight takes c7 should be fine, I guess. Um, right here, you're not going to have any kind of trouble with b6. So this should be fine. He still has to define what he's going to do with his minor pieces because his knight on b3 is a real problem. Um, a knight on b3 on the Sicilian usually serves a purpose to play a4 followed by a5 uh, to cramp these pawns here. Uh, so he might go for that, but with a pawn on c4, that plan kind of loses uh, a little bit of steam because you're going to go rook c8 immediately and you're going to hit the pawn on c4 and he's, he will start to defend at some point. Okay. Uh, so take. Okay, yeah, and, take and, and, and if, if white doesn't. Um... If white doesn't, if um, doesn't take, yeah, I, I was kind of worried about not having um, enough room to maneuver. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's kind of a problem in these Maroxi structures because, well, uh, white's main trump here is the fact that he has more space. Uh, he plays e4 and c4 to establish uh, some domination in the center. Um, you have to operate within your first third, your uh, three first ranks, and uh, that's actually um, that's actually very common. I play um, the hedgehog actually, so okay. I don't even ha I don't even have a pawn on e5 most of the time, and I operate on the first three ranks, and uh, except the time I play knight e5 at some point, but then I go back with knight g6, so. Uh, I'm very used to uh, to playing on the first three ranks. It can be uncomfortable, but you need to um, give a mission to your pieces. If your pieces are well coordinated, uh, if they have something to do, there's no problem. 
And actually, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, why it has a space advantage? But a space advantage is relevant um, in the sense that the one who has no space can't move his pieces around and he, he can't get them to useful squares. And here you can. So even though white has a space advantage, it's not as, as significant as in situations where, where uh, your pieces are just too restricted. The important thing is to have a plan and to find a way of deploying your pieces. Uh, I, well, I took a look at some sample variation. After bishop e3, what would you play here? I'm just taking a look at a, a weird idea of uh, knight g4 and um, followed by uh, an f5. <laughs> um, uh, if not for that, I'm, I don't really have much of an idea. I guess uh, if not knight g4, if that doesn't work out, then my only other move that I'm considering would be Oh, no, that doesn't even work. I was, I was going to say uh, queen d7, but we just fall to a fork. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to maneuver here. Uh, well, as you see, why... Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, I have one more idea. One more idea would be knight d7 uh, preparing f5, and possibly we could also eventually put that knight on c5. Yeah. Uh, f5 is more difficult to get in than than you might think, and I want to get to that. <laughs> uh, let's first check knight g4. The thing about knight g4 is that you're going to, you're going to have to go back <laughs> probably uh, almost immediately. Well, he has knight, uh, bishop d6 here, which is pretty annoying. Yeah, um, I didn't see then, that. Yeah, he's going to push you back. And, um, well, that, that's best case scenario. Uh, and knight d7 is a very good move. Well, as you see, white has no intention of giving up uh, the pride of his position, that beautiful knight on d5. And you're a little cramped here. You are, you are lacking space. But you have a plan. This knight is heading towards c5 at some point. Maybe not immediately, but he's heading there. You're covering b6 very important. And as you have a space disadvantage, you want to trade some pieces. You can keep all four minor pieces on the ball indefinitely. Um, a good plan here is to play bishop g5 and get rid of the dark squares, dark square bishops. And then you will have the possibility of taking on d5 and leave him with this bad bishop on d3. Uh, it's sort of similar to the accelerated dragon. I don't know if you're familiar with some schemes of the accelerated dragon. As as white. Uh, <laughs> as white. Yeah. Uh, and actually, well, the accelerated of... dragon. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because the accelerated dragon. I know as white, you can play knight c3 or c4, and the accelerated dragon is, I think, the only opening where I do play the Roxy bind. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, against the accelerated dragon is. It's topical. Uh, <laughs> everyone plays uh, e4 and c4, and it yields good results. Uh, but you might have encountered that uh, black in that in those situations, black actually goes bishop takes d5 at some point, and then he won. Uh, he goes for a blockade on dark squares with uh, a5 and knight c5, and even queen b6 at some point. Uh, it's uh, it's a very important main line, and here you can apply some of that knowledge to, to this position. Uh, it's not easy to cope with this knight on d5, but uh, you can adjust at least just for a, a, a little, a couple of moves 
more. Uh, for example, Queen D2, um, avoiding Bishop G5, preventing it for the moment. And now A5, and it's not so much to kick the knight. Uh, it can be, it, it could be a good idea. He doesn't do anything about it. Uh, but you're you're also getting good control of C5, and you even get to play B6 and Knight C5 at some point, and you're going to be okay. Um, for example, A4. Now you can go B6, and you are all ready to play Knight C5. If he takes on C5, then you're going to get a strong square for your Knight too, so you're going to be okay here. Uh, with A5, he also uh, gave up some control of dark squares. Uh, so this should be dynamically balanced. Uh, you shouldn't have many problems here. Maybe it's not what you're looking for when you play neither, but um, white is getting nothing out of it. Uh, the thing is, the way you play in the game, it's a little bit more awkward because after knight takes d5, he went c takes d, and now you have to lose the tempo with the bishop. Um, it starts to get a little tricky because this structure e4 and d5 versus d4, d6 and e5, uh, it gives a permanent space advantage to, to white, and especially in the queen side. And he has all his pieces looking towards the queen side, and you still have to develop the kind of the egg, so. You need to be careful here. Thankfully, you have uh, you have some useful ideas here. He played bishop e3. Uh, I'm not sure about bishop e3, and we are going to see why. Uh, but it's a little bit cramped for you. Uh, you still have ideas of a5, knight a6, and looking for this square. Um, some point maybe you should play like that. Well, but he reacted with bishop e3, and now you played f5. Um, what do you think about that? About that it's F5 it's now? totally a move I would make. That <laughs> I can, yeah. I I actually I see the date of this game. I guess this was from yesterday. I'm surprised I don't remember it better. Um, but <laughs> f5 is 100% the type of move I'll make uh, for for better or for worse. Um, I I just I think I'm feeling a bit claustrophobic and I'm just trying to do a pawn break and open things up. It goes with uh, in so its teachings. Uh, it's the closest to the base of the chain, so you're supposed to uh, to make it weaker uh, in. Means so it's ideal. Uh, you would play f5, and after f3, you would take on e4. So he retakes on e4, and then he will have a weaker pawn on e4 because it's uh, it can't be defended. No longer, uh, so kind of yeah, under and kind of undermining the e4 square. Yeah, that's the idea. Uh, when there are pawn chains, you have to to attack the base to undermine it, and well, you're going to soften it up a bit. Uh, the thing is, there are there are others, um, there are other features here implied. Uh, F5. Well, we are already acquainted with the with the perils of playing F5 and moving about yes. in the area of your. I, I, yeah, I uh, thought I thought here it wasn't the 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 dangers weren't really relevant here because we have the the pawns on D6 and and E5. Yeah, no, that's a good reasoning, and it, it's not that great a danger for your king, actually. Uh, the thing here are the light squares. This is very typical in the King's Indian, for example. When you can't retake with the pawn on f5, uh, you have to be careful about playing f5. Now white reacted in kind of an automatic way. He played f3, I believe. Yeah, he went f3, uh, but he takes f5. Uh, was a good way of handling the position. I guess he has some advantage here. Uh, the thing is, he's going to get control of the square on e4. Um, he's going to land a knight there very soon. And you're going to have some trouble in the light squares. After bishop takes f5, bishop takes f5, rook takes, 
and now 92. He's heading towards E4. Um, the thing is, this is a typical situation where you have a semi-open file, this EF file, uh, against this weak square on E4. Um, well, spoiler, the E4 square usually prevails, <laughs> uh, except in situations where you can mount some kind of attack on the king side and the rooks are relevant on the F file, the control of E4 kind of ties you down. If he goes knight E4, queen D3, uh, rook Fc1, or maybe even queen D3 hitting here, uh, you're going to be a little bit tied down. Uh, the knight on E4 hits on this seat, defends F2, uh, kind of prevents you from putting a knight here on C5. Uh, you're going to feel a little bit cramped uh, if he has total control of the light squares. And that's what happens if he gets total access to E4. Uh, so yeah, F5 is a move that should have um, sign of handle with care <laughs> most of the time. Uh, it's a perfectly natural attempt to to liberate yourself, <laughs> to to free your pieces, but it has some other drawbacks. He can create some good posts for his pieces. Uh, if you have no alternative, uh, it, it's something to think about. But what other ways of uh, handling this can you think of yeah i mean well i was just thinking after everything you said it would be nice to have my knight on d7 so that uh you know it could go to either f6 which would help help um prevent his knight from going from blockading our pawn or it could even potentially go to c5 if we had a rook on c8 um it's just a little bit painful to move my light squared bishop again because i had <laughs> But um, I guess, I mean, I don't know how good our light squared bishop is. I mean, it's definitely a lot better than our dark one. I guess we could move it with bishop a4, uh, but I don't know how badly we would really want to take that knight. But I guess at the same token, um, he can't really kick our bishop out. So maybe bishop a4 might have been an idea and then uh, knight d7. That's great, actually. It's not easy at all to spot this, but bishop a4 was a very valid way of, of getting your pieces out. <laughs> um, it's not easy to chase. Uh-oh. I think we got uh, disconnected here. Hang on. Okay, just hang on, folks. We got um, we got disconnected. His uh, connect his internet connection is not the greatest. I'm going to try calling him again. Um, hello. I think I'm here now. Yeah, uh, we we got disconnected I... there. Yeah, yeah. It... Oh no, it's, it's doing its thing again. Um, hang on here. Yeah. Hello, can you, you, you can hear me still? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, you, uh, it might be doing that thing when I switch windows. Um, you can still hear me? Yeah. Okay, so now let me you. try full size. And what about now? Yeah. You, you can still so, hear me good now? No. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, sorry. Good. Okay, so you, you were saying um, bishop yeah. a4. That's a very nice move. Uh, you were very concretely, I like that. Uh, you want to go knight d7, and then you're going to go a5 probably, just to cement the position of a knight that will land on c5 in the future. And it's not easy to kick out this bishop. I mean, you don't even have to take immediately. But uh, as we saw, once you kind of get the blockade on dark squares, you can think about giving up this bishop. Uh, if you don't have to immediately, then, then you're not going to trade it just because. <laughs> but um, 
it's a very it's a very good alternative here after something like queen g2 uh, well i guess i a5 first uh, to avoid to prevent uh, queen b4 and something like rook fc1 for example knight d7 and um, well you're all set to play b6 and knight c5 so you're kind of doing well here well, well, I, what what do you think about uh, simply taking the knight in, um, once he uh, um, uh, at which stage? Uh, once he moved, oh, sorry, um, once he moved the queen, I was I was just looking at the double pawns. I know that he opens up his rook, and that maybe that's dangerous. Yeah, uh, I don't like the looks of your dark squares here. Um, for example, I don't know if it's easy to play a5 now because then b4 could be a nuisance. Um, yeah, that's my own, my concern, I guess, is he might even be able to just push the b-pawn. Yeah, if he goes b4, then he fits in your pawn structure, and it's it's really important that you get to play a5 so that you can land a knight on c5. So if you don't get to play a5 on b6 comfortably, uh, then I wouldn't trade immediately. It's uh, it's really interesting that this this whole game you keep mentioning a five, but it's it's not a move I would ever have considered. <laughs> yeah. So, well, now now it's in your strategical toolbox. <laughs> yeah, it's still kind of a it's kind of a funky thing though for me to hear it. Like, uh, it's still kind of a really weird for me. It's really kind of a bizarre looking move. It looks strange. Um, and if you're not used to, well, for example, the accelerated dragon, it it looks bizarre. Uh, but with a knight on b3, uh, it happens in a lot of Sicilians because knight on b3 kind of is kind of um, off the game. <laughs> and a5 takes advantage of it. Uh, knight usually has to spend some time relocating somewhere, and then you get to play your desired maneuver with the knight to c5. Uh, well, here it, it's been, um, he has to take even more time to uh, to get somewhere. I wouldn't trade immediately, uh, even because of the fact that uh, you can do it anytime you like, so you can choose uh, the best the best moment. I mean, knight c1 looks, uh, looks ugly enough <laughs> just to just to reject it. I mean, you can go, well, not knight d7 because of b3 and your bishop is trapped, but you can play knight a6 and and suddenly you're doing fine. <laughs> b6 and knight c5 is coming either way. So uh, so you you get your pieces out. So that's the important thing. Um, bishop a4 was kind of an original way of getting your pieces out of each other's way, which wasn't easy because of your uh, lack of space, uh, but it was a very good solution, and I'm glad you thought of very concrete terms. Uh, in very concrete terms, when I when I asked you what would you do here, <laughs> um, the other try was Bishop G5, but I think it's a bit flawed. What do you think the problem could be? It's not like it's not like Black is losing or anything, but. There's a bit of a problem, I guess. Well, the very first thing I'm just thinking what I would do against is if bishop takes, queen takes, and then f4. Um... Oh, wait, what? What happened? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, uh, I... Okay, yeah, bishop takes uh, f4. Well, actually, I guess... No, sorry. I, uh, no, no, that's okay. No, not, not, not. No, that black would be fine there. So hang on. Well, I wonder about just um, changing the move order. Simply F four right away looks pretty good, I think, because I don't think we can afford to take because. I think why we don't want to allow white to be able to to push like e5 and have those two bishops pointed at us. So I'm actually I'm concerned most about f4 here. Well, f4 
the thing is, uh, you're getting e5 for your pieces. Uh, he's giving up some squares. Uh, yeah, he's getting the open f file, but after all this, it changes. This square is under your control, actually, so I don't think you're doing badly at all here. For example, something like bishop a4 at this point, and now you're seriously mm. going to post a beautiful knight here on e5, I guess. So, uh, well, maybe we have to consider if 5 here. I don't know how sound this is, but yeah, if 5 might be a problem, so bishop a4 has to wait. e5? Uh, uh, e5 would be a problem there? Uh, yeah, I was thinking about... Because um... I, I was thinking we can take and he's going to have two pieces to worry about. Yeah, but if you take here, there's a blow. I'm, I'm very. Oh, you're looking at like about. queen h5, bishop takes h7. Yeah, yeah, but I think I'm. Well, no, I'm sorry. Here you can take on a4 and and forget about your troubles. <laughs> the bishop is hanging. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, the bishop is hanging, so there's no oh, point. For oh, right, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, maybe now. Well, can we, we just, uh, yeah, we just take the take the, the take the knight first then? Take on b3, and now i probably take with the a pound. Yeah, and then just. Just because I want to have the queen, the possibility of, of bringing the queen uh, and then d e oh e e bishop take take g seven king takes queen h by check king g eight rook h four but I overlooked an amazing defense there um yeah uh well without moving the pieces let's see if we can if we can see this after now after a takes b three d takes e five I was thinking about bishop takes h7 check, mm -hmm. king king takes h7, queen h5 check, king g8, and now rook h4, which threatens checkmate. But can't we just push the f pawn there, or even uh, yeah. e, or even just rook e8? Oh, sorry, uh, no, 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 well, no, rook e... yeah, no, rook yeah. e8, yeah. But uh, I, I think we could still play f f6. Yeah, you have f6. Uh, I also overlooked this uh, queen b6 check and then queen h6. Uh, threatening to ah, right. change the queen. Um, I don't see that. <laughs> wait. Uh, but f6 okay, is um, now. But where would the queen, where's white's queen there? It's on h, uh, it's on uh, h5. h5. Ah, right. Yeah, okay. So you threaten to change the queens and that's kind of definitive. <laughs> um, I was also yeah, just wondering so are... the possibility of. It's probably bad though. I was just thinking if, um, you know, bishop after bishop takes h seven, we we go king h eight, but that's probably yeah, but bad yeah. after queen h five. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that doesn't work. Uh, you can also take with a queen here, and it seems a little bit messy. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, but. Uh, I'm afraid it doesn't look that good for black. Um, well, you can still go e takes f4, queen takes a8, queen b6 check, and the pawn on b2 falls, but, well, uh, it's anyone's game, I guess. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried about this past pawn here, but... Um, it's very hard to evaluate. Uh, even so, after f4, e takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, uh, you don't need to go bishop a4. It's, uh, it might be just too risky, I guess. Uh, you can play queen e7, and, and at some point you're going to go knight e7, I guess. Um, it's not so worrying for black. Uh, you can even put the queen on e5, and, and it's a beautiful queen. <laughs> Uh, so after bishop g5, bishop takes, queen takes, 
uh, I'm sorry, after bishop g5, the possibility was just taken on g5 because, well, this is taking a lot of time for black. And the queen goes too far away from the queen side, and now it starts to get a little bit awkward because the knight gets to c4, it hits on, c on these seats. And, well, in this version of the game, you still haven't uh, solved the problem of your manual pieces, and, and the disadvantage in space is going to start to tell if white creates some concrete threats on the queen side. Uh, so after bishop e3, in conclusion, bishop a4 was a nice solution uh, as to where your pieces are going to land. Uh, it's not easy to find, but well, f5 has its own problems. We saw that it takes f5 is a good way of, of getting some squares on the center, but he went for f3, which is a more standard reaction, and you played well here. f4, bishop f2. And you went for an exchange, which makes a lot of sense when uh, when you're trying to uh, to solve the problem of not having enough room for your pieces. Rook c1, bishop takes, rook takes. And now you went queen b6, which is perfectly fine. And it's in the spirit of, of the accelerated dragon and, and this kind of... Um, of structure. A5 is also an option. It's always an option, believe it or not. <laughs> um, also, Bishop A4 was very nice here because you're still getting 97 in um, and you're comfortable at this point. Uh, the game kind of ended in a rush here. Uh, Rook C8, Queen D2, he started wandering around with his pieces and now you got full equality. And well, here you made a blunder. You, you might have thought that your queen was already defended. And that's a shame because you solved all your problems and you're doing perfectly fine here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, don't even, I don't even remember making the blunder. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, the knight discern. Actually, you, I prefer black at this point. Uh, you're going to play rook c8 first. And... This is kind of what happens uh, when the side with a, with a space advantage uh, kind of trades all the pieces and doesn't get anything out of it. Uh, he kind of gets a little bit overextended. And his king is, you could argue, somewhat more exposed. You're going to get the C file, and there are a lot of squares that could be exploited by black. And we can say the same for white. Uh, that's a little bit of a problem you you have when you don't make anything out of your space advantage. Uh, well, here, knight b7. Um, well, I think he was going to have some trouble equalizing here because you are you're doing better already. Um, well, I want us to go to the next game because uh, it presented some similar themes. Uh, well, first, maybe just in this same game. Let me show you what kind of structure I'm talking about uh, when I mentioned uh, the accelerated dragon. Uh, I'm no expert, so please have a little bit of patience. <laughs> uh, I don't really know this variation very well. Nice C6, Bishop E3, something of sorts. Knight uh, C3, D6. I guess this is kind of the, the yeah, this is kind of typical. Yeah, I it's usually a, a little bit of a slower game, uh, and I think I I, I used to uh, kingside castle. Well, I think you kind of obligated after the Maroxi bind. Yeah, uh, yeah, with the pawn on c4 uh, going for long castling is suicide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it might just be too much. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly the theoretical way, but I believe it's something like this. And now knight d5. Uh, what would you play here? This is a very typical situation in the accelerated dragon, and it's kind of similar to what you had in your game, except, well, the pawn is still on e7. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he doesn't have full control of d5.
it's a little tough. It's a little tough. So, um, I looked at a number of moves. <laughs> uh, I, I even looked at a five cause you mentioned it last time, but I don't like a five cause I think it makes B six incredibly weak. And, um, then I was considering, I was considering like knight D seven, but then I don't want to trade off our queen kettled bishop. Um, I looked at e5, but then I think, again, our dark squared bishop is very unhappy. So I actually, I think my best move that I could come up with here is e6. Just um, Well, get... uh, yeah, e6 is kind of in this point. That's, yeah. that's what I didn't like about it. But um, otherwise, I'm, I can't really, I don't have a great idea of a move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh... Well, the problem with these seats uh, is that with your bishop from g7 and with this maroxibine, uh, well, first of all, it's not that easy to play d5 against c4 and e4, so uh, that pawn break is just too difficult to implement. And if that's so, then after e6, you much rather have this bishop uh, on e7 than on g7. And I don't think you can get away with it in the long run. I mean, after e6, maybe not knight takes f6, bishop takes, bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, queen takes e6 because this pawn is hanging, so you are okay, but uh, I guess that white can just go back and then double up on the d file and you're going to have a lot of trouble with, with this pawn. Uh, but you can play something similar to, to what we were looking at. 97, you mentioned it, and it's actually quite good. Um, I know you don't want to trade uh, the pride of your position, the, <laughs> the dark squared bishop uh, that is so beloved by dragon players. Uh, the thing is that you don't have much of an option. I mean, this opposition of bishops uh, doesn't give you much of a choice. Uh, at some point, these two bishops are going to go off the board. Um now you're going to play knight c5 and a5 at some point. For example, after bishop takes, uh, king takes. Again, I, I'm not certain that, that this is the, the exact way of playing this for black. I think you have to go bishop takes b5 first so that you make him take here maybe he can take with the queen so it's not so advantageous for for white uh, and then yeah you go a5 and your plan is to take full control of all the dark squares on the queen side then you're going to go knight c5 and even queen b6 rook fc8 and you're going to have a good game uh, you're kind of playing against a bad bishop for white uh, but still well white has some space advantage so uh, we have to take him seriously too, uh, but it's a very instructive way of of uh, fighting for squares on the queen side against this type of structure. And this, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I don't know if bishop takes immediately. I think knight d7 is the move, and then after bishop takes, king takes, then you're going to get rid of the knight and play with this bishop against. And this knight against this bishop and take full control of the dark squares. And it's that's why I compared your game to the to uh, to accelerated dragon because of the ideas on the queen side were uh, pretty similar. Um, so as you see, you can um, uh, you can bring the knowledge of some of your structures to to even to entirely different systems. Um, so you might even want to take up the accelerated dragon. Who knows? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, I'm not I a dragon so. player, <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's okay. useful though. It's useful to know. That's the nice thing about playing um, like the same opening as both colors, because you kind of it kind of, the yeah. yeah. You can put in practice some of the ideas of. Mm -hmm of one system to the other. And um, it's also less theory to know. Cause <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Okay, I want to take a look at this other game against Extreme. Uh, well, you were black again, played this uh, Alapin, uh, the C3 Sicilian, and he played well. This is a pretty silly move. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, this kind of thing uh, might seem a little bit ridiculous, but if we don't do anything about it, he's going to get away with it, actually. Uh, here, his plan is kind of obvious. He wants to go D4 and have a full center of pounds. Uh, that would look pretty good. Um, you play nice seats, uh, which might not be the most. Yeah, I was. I, I think after the game, when I analyzed it without an engine first, I was kind of thinking e5 might have been an interesting response because we're immediately controlling the dark squares of d5 or d4 and uh, f4, and kind of making. And then I think that makes f3 look extra silly. Yeah, e5 was strong. I mean, if he can't get in d4, then that pawn on f3 has nothing to do there. Um, next, you're going to play d5, and now f3 is going to look very silly. I don't even know how he's going to take his pieces out because they are kind of both competing for the same square on each two. So yeah, e5 uh, underlined that f3 was a double. Nice he sits. Well, now he kind of got away with it. Um, he can hope to is to establish a, a nice center of pounds. Of course, he can't be better at this point. I mean, he he was very played very strange. <laughs> uh, well, now he sits, but as you see, if you just take your pieces out and and you don't find a way of actually contesting the center, then he's going to be okay. And um, well, you went back with your pieces and. At well, this H4 seems bold. <laughs> um, uh, well, this is a structure I wanted to get to. Uh, now it's pretty obvious that you're cramped. I mean, after your after that imprecision in the opening, it was kind of tough for you to find a way to to contest the center. And now you get a typical structure where he has a space advantage. And the problem is that you still have your four minor pieces, and that's kind of the measure of how bad the lack of space is. Uh, because if you only had a couple of minor pieces here, then maybe it's not so bad. Uh, the space advantage is, and disadvantage, <laughs> is a matter of uh, the capacity of your position or the ability of your own position to uh, give good squares to your own pieces. Uh, that's the main issue with, with a space advantage. And here, it's kind of obvious that your position doesn't have enough capacity or room for your pieces to uh, to get to good squares. I mean, this knight on this turn is pretty bad piece. Uh, you can say the same about the bishop PA. The nine on C6 doesn't have so many perspectives. Um, yeah, you're going to have to do something very soon. Uh, but it's dangerous too, because if you play F6, your king is maybe it's going to suffer a bit. He was, uh, he kept on advancing the H pound, just like Magnus is used to these days. <laughs> he goes H4, H5 at mm -hmm. any chance. <laughs> But he does it kind of okay. <laughs> uh, F6, F4. Uh, what do you think about F5? This is where I wanted to get. Um, to be honest, I'm slightly surprised I played F5. Um, because... You would think I would kind of want to open things up to get some more space. So I'm I'm a little surprised I played f5. Um, I think 
there may also possibly, I don't know how realistic the threat is, but there could be some danger of white um, either keeping, keeping his king in the center or casting queenside and then being able to just push everything at me uh, on the king side um, with, you know, like a, a G4 and kind of crack things open there. Um, if I had taken instead on E5, I don't really, it doesn't really give me that much more space because I still can't go, I can't put anything on F6, but maybe the, if, if we have that open F file, I could put the, we maneuver the bishop to, to E7 and then rook F8 and maybe get a bit of room that way. Yeah, uh, you're clearly struggling at this point. Um, it's difficult to find something to do for your pieces, and White has many ways of improving. He, he might be able to go um, knight g3 at some point, and then bishop d3. It's not so easy though, because after something like bishop li, I'm sorry, knight g3, f takes e5, f takes e5, and then you have things like knight d takes e5. And he, if he takes d takes e5, you're going to have d4, and, and you are uh, you have fork over to d So he has to be a little bit careful with those teams. Uh, but still, uh, you're kind of suffering for, from lack of space. The thing is that after f5, you deprive yourself of all kind of counterplay. Uh, I remember an annotated game. I never forgot about it because it kind of impressed me. Uh, it was a French defense, uh, the same structure as you have here, uh, where Black had already played c4. Uh, he didn't take c, take d, but he played c4. Um, the position was close, but White was uh, on command because his pieces were more active and he had space uh, on the king side. And suddenly Black played f5, and the Reski commented that. Uh, Black deprived himself from all kind of counterplay after that, so White had a free hand on the king side to do everything he wanted. Uh, at least he had to take uh, to keep tension in the center and um, look for f takes e5 or maybe uh, combine play on the queen side, but always with the thought of taking an e5 or at least uh, at least making White a little bit. Uh, we're having him on check about that. After f5, White didn't worry anymore about things like f takes e5 and knight takes e5 or those kind of things. And he gets, he really gets a free hand to play on the king side, especially since uh, you don't have any kind of um, obvious counterplay on the queen side. Uh, in fact, he went for g4 immediately. It might be too reckless, but well, he he might even get away with this. Uh, pawn takes knight g3. You had your opportunities though, because after this he made a, he made a, yeah he made a mistake here. He played b4. I think here he could have played knight a4, uh, kicking your queen out, and then he can recover here. On G4, he's going to be. What? Uh, what about? Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, but before, uh, well, you have an opportunity here to to make a mess out of this, <laughs> and it's a typical shot in the in the French defense. So I'm going to give you uh, a minute to. Well, I mean, the very first thing I, I considered was knight takes. Um getting the two pawns um, in, in exchange for the knight. And then we would have, I guess, two passed pawns for the knight. Um, yeah. But I, uh, I'm I'm so materialistic that I, I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if it was enough. I, I, I didn't want to take the risk, so I didn't go with it. I think I was also uh, slightly worried about um, rook b1. So after... Um, knight takes b4, a takes b4, bishop takes b4, rook b1. Again, oh, you're talking about taking 
perfume before. Yeah. Uh, I thought about the other one. Oh, oh no. Think about this. Oh, no. Totally would not have never considered that in a million years. <laughs> Uh, this one is very interesting. Okay, so because... the D pawn is pinned, and if he takes with the F pawn, oh, I see. Then we could recapture again. Um, it's a mess. It is a mess. It's a lot so... to consider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now it's not clear at all, especially the rapid gain. Um, I was an MB white. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was much easier a couple of moves before. What, uh, what Actually, about what about um, knight a four here? Knight a four. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, we have a check though. We have a check. We can get out of. Yeah, three. we have. A, at least we can save the knight. But we're still yeah. we we Queen still we, we're still down a, a minor piece. Yeah. After queen takes, pawn takes. Oh, I don't even see. Yeah, I guess. Oh, uh, maybe not. How about bishop takes before check here? Oh my god, it's so, it's so messy, so sharp. I like this one. <laughs> What's going oh, on? It's way too sharp for me. <laughs> well, they're going to. There are so many pounds now. I'm starting to like this actually. <laughs> uh, if he goes king f2, yeah, if he goes king f2, for example, g takes f3, queen, and uh, knight takes, pawn takes, and he can take the bishop because the pawn is pinned. Um, oh, so he's sharp. You <laughs> got plenty of pounds. At least it was a mess. I'm not convinced that knight takes, knight c takes e5. Actually works, but uh, I it's not it's not a straight win for why that's for sure, uh, and it was a very good practical chance because well, uh, if you keep playing normally, your position is going to be beyond repair. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's what you have to take into account to uh, make a decision like this. Uh, I'm sorry, like this. If you keep playing normal moves. You probably are, get, you are going to get crushed because you, your pieces are doing nothing and the attack is going to be very strong very soon. Uh, so knight c takes e5. Uh, yeah, it was. I'll be worried as white. It was a a nice tactical shot. And in the French, it's kind of common to give up a piece for two pounds in the center this way. Uh, this tactical shot is kind of. Um, it's, it's kind of thematic, so it might be the way to go here. A5 is also thematic, but well, you are having some trouble here. Yeah, he's, he's uh, mounting up an attack with not so much effort. And that's the problem with the lack of space. Your pieces all step over each other, and the lack of space itself makes it makes it very difficult to transfer your pieces from one side of the board to the other. And it's completely the opposite for white. I mean, it's so easy to play bishop d3, rook g1, and make some mortal threats here. Uh, well, uh, something all happened. Uh, it might be a mouse because you played queen c6 here. Um, uh, you, might want, you might have wanted to play queen c7 and, and slip the queen here. Um, it's possible. Um, it's also possible. This is the start of my my tilt, <laughs> because I wow. was I I was. This is my peak. I was two thousand thirty in this game, and I might have been angry that my opponent was two hundred points below me, and he played f three on move three, and I'm like, how come he's getting this position? Um, <laughs> so I I I may have did that. Uh, uh, I may have played that out of anger. Um, I'm trying to remember where things went wrong. I mean, I played. I oh, oh did did I play e5? Oh no, I didn't play e5. I played knight c6 yeah, on move three, right? These situations are very tricky because in the opening your opponent makes a move so silly as f3 and you suddenly think, well, he has to lose this. I mean he can get away with this. And you start to try to punish him and when you don't manage to do it, uh 
you get frustrated. It's a very common feeling. Actually, uh, you see that Carson uh, many times plays things like this against GM opposition on the internet. Um, oh yeah, his well, openings are all, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely crazy. I don't know how, how he managed to, to, <laughs> to beat so to beat them so easily playing pretty much anything. Yeah. Uh, but you see that uh, many of his opponents are trying to punish him and they get frustrated because he keeps on finding uh, incredible resources. <laughs> and, and well, for one part, you you have you have to play energetically when your opponent. Uh, that's something so extravagant and F3, which can't be good at all. Uh, but it's also important to keep your head down to earth because you're still not winning or anything like it. I mean, you might not even be better uh, objectively here. You might, you're might you okay with black. It's easier to play with black. And obviously, white is not posing you any kind of problems in the opening. Uh, but our head usually tells us you're winning here. He can't get away with a three. Uh, we have to take a more calm approach here. E5 is clearly the move because it underlines that F3 is useless because F3, all he wants to do with F3 is establish is to establish a, a nice pawn center with D4. Now you played E5, E5 you are preventing that. So. F3 is starting to look a little bit awkward. Uh, but he can still play this. I mean, he can go bishop c4 and play knight d2 and try to keep the, the damage to the minimum. Um, you're, you're going to be fine, but you might not blow him away off the board. Uh, but it's kind of common that after that happens, we make not uh, we might not make the best moves um, and suddenly he gets good play it, it happens, it happens a lot for example here he sits uh, you're not putting any pressure on the center um, well he's, he kind of got his pieces out very quickly and his center held and once he gets e4 and d4 against your little center he's going to be dead what do you think uh, would be a better move to Contest the the center here. I'm liking e5 immediately. Uh, so that we so d4 make him... uh, d5. D5 is critical. Uh, I guess we can try something like this, and uh, then go bishop c5 and this. Uh, this might well be a try. Yeah, this could be it. Um, like knight ninety two, ninety two. No, there's nothing there. Um, yeah, maybe bishop c five. Um, um, yeah, this is fine. This is fine, I guess. Um, bishop e, uh, bishop e three. Uh, well, now we have knight takes f3. Ah, uh, right, five. yeah, yeah. I thought it was dangerous, <laughs> undefended, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, e5 is a way of contesting the center in here. I mean, he hasn't developed any piece and um, dedicated uh, uh, all his moves to establish the center. So a blow to the center is logical. Uh, it always has to be calculated, of course, but... Uh, well, d5, I don't like d5 because I couldn't find anything after e5. Um, after any knight move, he's going to go bishop 3, and I guess he's getting his pieces out. I didn't like that. But if I looks sounder to me. Uh, well, if he doesn't go d5, you're going to play it at some point, so so I don't think he can, he can get away with another move. Yeah, you might you might be fine here. I don't say you are better, but uh, White can uh, fall into some practical problems very quickly if he uh, if he doesn't if he isn't careful. Probably he has to play Bishop E three to get in B two. But well, even then, I don't know if it's so easy because you're threatening 
things here. For example, Queen D2, Knight C2 check and get to to eat that bishop. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I guess you could go that way. Uh, after you don't contest the center, then yeah, he he gets a free hand there and, and he's going to to have an advantage in development. Uh, but yeah, that's that's for the space advantage. Uh, I left. Uh, again, for you to analyze, uh, it's on the, on the lesson study, Rubinstein against Duras. The game is very well annotated in the game, in the book by Gelfand, uh, Positional Decision Making in Chess, which is uh, an amazing book. Uh, it's very well annotated there. Well, well I, I did some annotations on my own. Um, for you to go through that the ones in the book are very thorough very full of variations and yeah uh, it's kind of not the point i wanted you to to go through the games to to see how rubinstein dealt with the space advantage and how he milked uh everything out of the the fact that he had this structure e4 and d5 versus uh e5 and d6 uh it's a it's a very well-known game and it kind of blew my mind because he made it look so easy uh, how he exploited the space advantage that it's it's really impressive. You're going to see. Okay, <laughs> I'll take a look at that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the oh. the lesson this week. Um, thank you. I, I want to wish you good luck again in your upcoming tournament. Um, no pressure. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. You don't have to get the IM norm, but it would be nice. Maybe even if you just increase your rating, that's always a, a nice perk as well. Um, and then um, a week after that, I am going to my tournament. So in ten days, I have oh, my okay. tournament. So in our next lesson, which will be, I guess, two weeks from now, um, yeah, we will be able to. You can look over my tournament games. So you you have That's some high great. yeah you have some nice high quality high quality games uh, to look it's, at. It's uh, it's classical time control. Yes, it's it's same as yours, ninety and thirty, and I'm playing great. in the under sixteen hundred section. I'm number three seed currently, and um, oh, yeah, it, you have your own pressure there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in the in the last tournament, I was number two seed, uh, but. Uh, my my section is full of super underrated people so um yeah the, that's everything yeah. <laughs> i can't imagine yeah yeah but um we, okay, we should have some really good some really good games to look at um in our next session yeah that's good material yeah. well i wish you a lot of success yeah um, hopefully we both do well do that well. would be nice <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. okay thank you again i'll see you okay bye thank you see you